everyone. Today we have Ryan Williams from Stanford. Uh, Ryan did his PhD from CMU. Ryan works on circuit lower bounds. And to quote Scott Allenson, he's famous for making complexity theory look less embarrassing. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about how a circuit lower bounds can be useful in finding shortest paths, or uh, all their shortest paths in graphs. Before we start, a couple of uh, announcements. The next speaker is David Woodruff in two weeks, followed by Jian Bing. And uh, again, as usual, you'll be muted during the talk, but if you have a question, feel free to ask and ask lots of questions. Uh, we'll now go around the table introducing the groups. So. Okay, so there's uh, we have a group from uh, Colombia. Here's uh, uh, a group of hello. two. <laughs> a group of two. Um, there's uh, uh, Grant. Grant is here. Grant Schenberg. From hey, Michigan. Hello. Hi guys. <laughs> There's a group from uh, NYU from Courant. And can we see you? No, we can't see you yet. So it's Hug Bennett there and others. Uh, oh, we can see the ceiling. Yeah, nice ceiling. There's uh, K. Gopalakrishnan. Hello. Yeah, for some reason my uh, webcam is not working. <laughs> so. Okay, well, we can hear you. <laughs> so welcome, uh, Madur. Hi, Madur with the uh, group from uh, TTI, and we have uh, Michael, Michael Deans from Johns Hopkins, and a few others, hello everyone. Uh, Thomas, Thomas Hollenstein from uh, ETH, hi. Hi. Hi, and we have a group from far away, we're all eating pizza there, hello Weizmann. <laughs> um, I hope the time zone change helped you a bit. And um, that's also back to you in India. OK, let's start now. Uh, OK, so Ryan, you can start now. All right. Um, thank you, Ninja, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone, from rainy Palo Alto, California. It's, it's actually raining here um, pretty strongly. And it's spring break, so it's a nice, quiet theory group right now. Um, Shouldn't be any interruptions during the talk. Um, yeah, so I just want to say before I start, I'm really happy to participate in this uh, virtual conference. I've seen some of the recorded talks, and I know I have a high standard to maintain, so thanks uh, to the organizers. Um, now, on to the talk. So over the past few years, I've managed to convince some uh, budding complexity theorists that they should pay attention in their algorithms classes. Uh, namely, I've shown that set algorithms that run even a little bit faster than exhaustive search can be used to prove circuit complexity lower bounds, and this has led to some uh, new work in circuit complexity. Now, if I had to briefly summarize the moral of the present talk, I would say it's about why algorithm students should stay awake in their complexity courses. Um, so what I'm about to describe could have easily been found 20 years ago, and this is not really an exaggeration. Everything I do is at least that old, I think, if not older. Uh, the difference, uh, of course, will be in how I use the old stuff. And I hope to convince you that what I'm doing here is very natural. And it's probably, if, if it's not um, the right way, it's morally related to the right way of, of trying to think about making further progress on some tough old problems in algorithms. OK? Um, so on the left here is supposed to be a gigantic graph that actually is part of um, uh, a graph of internet routers, and on the, other, on the right side is supposed to be a circuit. All right, so uh, so this talks about all pairs shortest paths, or as I like to call it, OPSUP, APSD, or OPSUP sounds, sounds better to me. Um, so we all know what this problem is, right? Uh, so it needs no definition, or well, does it? Because there are different ways to define the problem, and depending on how you define it, uh, you can get different answers. So, so let's be concrete. So we usually think of uh, OPSUP as the following problem. Uh, we're given an in-node graph. It's a weighted graph. And so we define this graph by um, a weight function from pairs of nodes to positive reals and perhaps even infinities. Uh, but in this talk, I won't, I won't really deal with infinities uh, directly can just think of infinity as just being a, a real uh, so large that um, you would never take it in the shortest path. Okay. So just think of this as like a, a function from pairs of nodes to the real numbers. So the nodes are just numbered between 1 and n. Um, 
So we can define a graph just by a, such a weight function. And we want to compute for all pairs of nodes the shortest path from i to j. Okay. But what does this mean, really? Because um, it, it could take a cubic space just to write down uh, the shortest path for all pairs. Line is the graph, uh, is the graph directed or undirected? Oh, it's, it's directed in the sense that, right, um, right, I have a distinguished first and second node here, okay. so it, it, the, the function could output something different on ij to j or ji. Right, so it's directed. Um, it turns out that for the purposes of getting faster algorithms for all pairs shortest paths, like subcubic algorithms, um, that distinction doesn't matter. Um, that's in a paper of Virginia and mine, but, but yeah, for, let's just think that's the most general case of directed graph. So, right, so it could take cubic space just to write down these paths explicitly, um, in which case trying to get a faster than in cubed algorithm uh, wouldn't be possible. So what we instead define it is the following problem. So it's a like more proper way to define it. Um, so we're, again, we're given this graph defined by a weight function, but uh, we want to compute an n by n matrix S that will basically serve as a data structure to help us reconstruct shortest paths. So for all i, j, so for all pairs of nodes i and j in this graph, the i, j entry of s is going to be some k ranging from 1 to n with the following property, that there is a shortest path from i to j that starts with the edge i, k. So, um, so such a s always exists. Okay, this is called a successor matrix. Okay. And it's easy to see, we could describe this matrix in n squared log n bits, right, just by specifying whatever vertex we're going to put in each of the ij entries. Now, given such an S, oh, we can think of it as some data structure and use it to reconstruct shortest paths from any node S and T. Um, we could do it in order P time, where P is the number of edges in the path, right? So if I wanted to find um, a shortest path from S to T, I would first look up the ST entry, I would get some uh, answer k, and then I would look up the kt entry, get some answer l, look up the lt entry, get some other answer, and eventually I would reach t. Right? And so from this, I can reconstruct a, a shortest path in the graph. So, so this, is, this is a way I'm going to think about this problem. You could also think about it as all pairs shortest distances, just computing the shortest distance between all pairs of nodes. But this, I mean, is slightly more general in the sense that you actually can reconstruct the paths efficiently. Okay. Um, the, I guess it's clear. Um, okay. So, all right, so that's the, that's the problem. And so in principle, we could solve it in something close to in squared time, the, the size, something linear in the size of the input. Okay. So now, uh, what's the computational model? All right. So we have to be careful about the model here. Um, it could affect the results. We want something realistic, but not too crazy. I mean, we're working with real numbers, uh, and they could be very large. So we're going to separate the kinds of operations that we do on real numbers from the kind of operations that we can normally do um, with, like, say, bit, bit operations. Okay, so, so the model we're going to look at is the so-called real RAM model. Um, it's a random access machine model, with, but it has two types of distinguished registers. Okay. There's real valued registers, and there's typical registers. Okay. The real valued registers hold real numbers. Okay. Each holds a single real number. And the kind of operations you can do is you can add a pair of real valued registers and put the output in another real valued register. You can subtract two, and you can compare the two registers, say one holding A, one holding B. And the outcome of that comparison will go into a typical register. Okay, now, a typical register is just one that does the, the usual kind of thing that when we are doing uh, bit tricks, say, on a RAM, each of them hold, like, say, order log n bits. And the operations that we can do there are all the usual bit instructions that you would uh, permit on a, on a processor. Okay? So the, really the only interaction that we have between real value and typical registers is this comparison operation. But the outcome of it, true or false, goes into a typical register which will hold like a zero or a one. Okay. All right. So this sort of limits, um, you know, our ability to like say if we were able to do exponentiation or multiply in some crazy way with reals, we could uh, perhaps solve problems that are not actually solvable in real life. So 
So this sort of limits what we can do with the reals just enough so that we can actually speak meaningfully about all pairs shortest paths. So an instance of APSP here is uh, specified using just n squared real valued registers given to us. And so we've designed this model, or specified it here, to be as general as possible so that the floyd warshall algorithm and you know, all previous algorithms and so on uh, will take n cube steps to solve all three shortest path problems. I mean, I didn't define this model. Other people define it. I think uh, Fredman defined it in the 70s. And, but this is the usual model that we, that we consider. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so a major open question in the 1960s was whether the n-cubed time algorithm for Floyd Warshall on n-node graphs was optimal. Um, and a partial answer was given by Kerr in his PhD thesis in 1971, where he showed, yes, in fact, it is optimal if you only allow additions and comparisons on real numbers. Okay. So we don't allow these typical registers. We don't allow the bit tricks and things like that. But, um, but we know additions and comparisons, it's a rather restricted model, right? We know that, if, that sorting requires in log n if you only allow comparisons, but you can do faster if you're sorting integers and you allow bit operations. So we could just ask if you know, allowing bit operations on the outcomes of comparisons could help us here. And so a better answer was given by Fredman in uh, 75, where he, sh he showed, in fact, no, uh, in cube time is not optimal on the real RAM. Uh, you can do slightly better. So I'm going to use some uh, O hook no notation uh, to omit poly log log in factors here. So, so you can't see the yes. slides anymore. Can other people see the slides still? Uh, uh, it seems visible here. Uh, does yeah, yeah I can see the slides. You can or you can't? I can see the slides. Yeah, it seems fine here. I can yeah, see. It fine here. kind of came back for a second there. Hmm. There now. Now I can see them. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So, ops up is an n cubed over log to the one third of n time. This is what Fredman showed. Um, so this is again omitting like log, probably log log n uh, factors. And this was done by um, basically taking the outcomes of a bunch of comparisons and and doing a lot of pre-processing, lots of bit tricks, storing lots of lookup tables, and and speeding up um, the search for all the shortest paths, like basically by bit, lots of bit tricks and lookup tables and things like that. Okay, and so this spawned a long line of work on all the shortest paths, um, which I have condensed uh, on the next slide here. So um, as you can see, the problem wasn't very neglected, um, but but there hasn't been a, a lot of progress here. So we basically uh, we've gotten from log to the one third to log squared, okay, and this is just over more and more sophisticated uh, pre-processing techniques and sort of uh, combinatorial tricks people did, um, but still it seems. You know, it, it's not clear uh, what what w we should ultimately expect from this kind of line of research. Um, so the major question in this area is whether all pairs shortest paths is in so-called truly subcubic time. So n to the three minus epsilon time for some fixed epsilon greater than zero. So it's ups up in into the 2.9 time. Okay. In current research, uh, as you can see seems pretty far from this. And um, so one might conjecture that such an algorithm is simply impossible. Um, and in fact, this we addressed this question in, in prior work uh, with Virginia, where we said maybe the answer to this question is no. Okay. And what we showed was a kind of uh, completeness result for all pairs shortest paths. So, we show that a large collection of problems either all have truly subcubic time algorithms or none of them do. And so among this list is, is this op sub, but also minimum weight triangle. So you're given a graph with weights, and you want to find just a triangle in this graph so the sum of the three edge weights is minimized. 
um, matricity. So you're given um, a matrix, an n by n matrix. You want to know if it defines a metric. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ones. So finding a minimum cycle, um, verifying that, a, like a so-called distance product of two matrices, computing a distance product, this problem called the second shortest paths problem, replacement paths, and and so on. There's uh, more than nine problems that we've found to be equivalent. The idea, though, is that we're building a theory of hardness and completeness for polynomial time. Okay, we can start to reason that perhaps op stuff is hard to solve in truly subcubic time for the same reason that we believe uh, that NP hard problems are indeed hard, because a large number of other problems would simultaneously be solvable in truly subcubic time if one of them could be solved. Okay. So, so that we thought of this as evidence that, that, okay, maybe this is not possible. And besides, uh, right, if we... If we look back at this at this table, right, it, it seems it's been very difficult to get any progress except for tiny log factors. So a big question to answer before even trying to address the major one, at least if you want a yes answer, would simply be to ask if, uh, if OBSUP is an n cubed over log to the c in time for every c, for every constant c. So can we all, so, right, this is, research is often called shaving shaving log or something, so can we get a clean shave of all polylog factors of the complexity of, of uh, APSP? Um, so this has been a big question, and, and um, it was, oh, when I was talking with people about this, um, who studied the problem, they, they thought that this too was not possible. Um, but uh, in this talk, um, so our recent paper manages to find uh, such an algorithm. And so the main theorem is that there's a randomized algorithm for OPSUP running an n cubed over roughly 2 to the square root of log n time. So the way I've written it here is 2 to the L of n time, where L of n is at least uh, omega log n to the 1 half. Okay. So, right, so what we've got here is if we could set, you know, make that 1 half 1, then we would have a truly subcubic algorithm. On the other hand, like what we have is already, uh, you know, something much better than a polylog factor in the denominator. And so more more precisely, like what this algorithm does, it outputs a correct successor matrix S as we define the problem with high probability. Okay. So in this much time. Now uh, we can derandomize this algorithm. But uh, it's a fairly technical thing, and because we're actually going through uh, results in surrogate complexity, um, I didn't, I didn't really find uh, the actual uh, running time. But there is a delta greater than zero in a deterministic algorithm for OPSUP running in n cubed over two to the log n to the delta time. Okay, um, so, so we can de-randomize it and get something which is still um, saving over polylog factors. So this ops up as an n cubed over a log to the c in time for every c reason one. In fact, we have some, you know, something two to the fractional power of log is is going to be much better than any polylog. Um, and as a corollary, in fact, those uh, truly subcubic uh, reducibilities that we were talking about earlier. Um, they hold up uh, fairly well under, under even improvements like this. And so all the nine problems mentioned earlier, and in fact more problems that I didn't mention, all have algorithms with similar running times now. So they all have this sort of clean shape of all polylog factors off the problem, where the best algorithm known for any of them was n cubed over uh, log squared. Okay. So, so I think this, these results kind of question the, the uh, completeness theory that we developed. Uh, Virginia doesn't doesn't agree. <laughs> she, she thinks that OPSUP is probably still not in truly subcubic time. I think the ideas could actually lead to a truly subcubic time algorithm, and um, I'll speak a bit about that at the end. Um, the techniques here are perhaps more interesting than the quantitative improvement. In fact. So we exploit a property of OPSUP which makes it uh, simple from the point of view of circuit complexity, and then use tools, old tools from circuit complexity to solve the problem faster. And I'll go into more detail. Uh, in a moment. So uh, the actual proving theorems one or two would be probably ambitious, so I'm going to try to do something a little a little more toned down, which was still an open problem, 
So uh, theorem one prime, which I'll uh, cover in this talk, is um, for all k, there's a randomized algorithm for opsub on graphs that have only integer weights in the interval zero through into the k. Okay, so here all the weights on all the edges are bounded by some polynomial in the number of nodes. Yeah. Okay, so like the largest weight is into the k. Ryan, and if the yes. weights were just zero or one. I have a question. If the weights were just 0 or 1, was this yes. known how to, was the result then known? Yes, yes. So uh, there, there are a couple of algorithms. One of, for example, of Seidel in uh, 95, which shows that, yeah, in the un, well, in the undirected, un, unweighted case, you can get into the omega time. You can get the matrix multiplication exponent. Now, um, in the case of directed and unweighted, you can, you can also get truly subcubic. Um, this is a result of, of Arizvik. Um, so it's something like n to the 2.6, like this, and based on, again, based on matrix multiplication. Yeah, so, so what makes it difficult here is the weights. It's definitely, um, like, otherwise truly subcubic algorithms are And in fact, the completeness reductions that we have, the reducing between different problems, they also, you know, use the, use the weights too. Okay? So, right, so having just, but even having integer weights up to polynomial on n was already an open problem. And practically all the new key ideas are illustrated in this, in this special case. Um, so even getting this kind of algorithm would, uh, is interesting. All right. So, so let me give some intuition um, for why this talk is named the way it is, why you get faster, alter shortest paths via circuit complexity. Um, so there's a natural matrix product associated with OBSUP. Um, so it's the theorem of Fisher, and Meyer, and Monroe from 1971 that in order to solve um, OBSUP, it suffices to compute the so-called min plus matrix product of two matrices, say over the reals with uh, you know, the n by n matrices. Uh, this is also called a distance product. And it's defined as follows. So to get the ij entry of the product, we take the minimum over all k of aik plus bkj. Now, a usual matrix product would be the sum over all k of aik times bkj. So we're substituting the summation with a min and the product, the multiplication, with a, with a sum. So, so this matrix product already captures the difficulty of, of upsum. And what was also known is that there's a natural mapping from, say, max plus matrix products to normal matrix products, like the ones over plus and times. And, and this also holds for min plus as well. I mean, so a max plus matrix product is related to min plus simply by subtracting, uh, you know, flipping the sign of all the entries. Uh, you could go from one to the other. So, so I'll outline how this mapping goes. And this, in fact, this mapping is a starting point for the whole for this whole area of mathematics called tropical algebra, tropical geometry, and so on, where you systematically replace uh, plus and times with min and plus. So, so suppose we're given two matrices and we want to compute um, their max plus matrix product, okay, where we're taking the max, so we're all okay. Then we define two new matrices as follows. So a, a prime in the ij entry will simply be x to the aij, where x is some indeterminate. And B prime is going to be defined similarly. Okay, so so these are just some polynomials in the original with with degrees in the original entry. So then, um, if we let A prime times B prime be the usual matrix product, but this this time over you know rings of, of polynomials, then for all i j, let's let's think about what happens to the degree of the ij entry of this product. So this is some polynomial. Okay? If we just think about what it looks like, well, it's the sum over all k of x to the aik plus bkj. This is what happens when you take products. But if we think about what that degree means, it's exactly the max over all k of aik plus bkj. So, so by computing this matrix product, uh, in the usual type of matrix product, but over this ring of polynomials and taking the degrees of the polynomials, we can recover the, the max plus matrix product. Okay. This is all fine and good, looks nice, but there's a big problem. 
Right? The, the polynomials will, in general, have omega n terms in them, okay? And they will have, like, large degree, quite large degree, like, say, omega m, where m is the largest weight uh, that we have because we're exponentiating the entries uh, on the original matrices. So, like, if we were just using fast matrix multiplier, like the fastest matrix multiplier known, we could still take something like m times n of the 2.4 or maybe n times n of the 2.4 um, just because the sizes of the objects we're looking at could be omega n and they could have large degree. Uh, Ryan? Yes? Ask a quick question. So the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the theorem you mentioned before is that when you mean suffices, you mean up to log factors in the running time? Oh, uh, it's not only up to log factors. In fact, like it's um, up to constants. Right? So, so up to log factors is not hard to... Right. Show, but in fact, like it's there, um, it's up to up to uh, constants as well. Great, and thanks. It's a way to recursively decompose the, the problem um, and, and get something even tighter. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the natural way which people are looking at, and and see, and in fact, from this intuition alone, you can kind of see what will happen when you have um, when you have like say unweighted. Or you know, or weights of zero one. This kind of idea, this kind of thinking, will lead you exactly to truly subcubic algorithms in the low weighted or unweighted cases. Uh, but to deal with weights, this this uh, approach, you know, you know, the starting point of tropical algebra, is just not going to work uh, as as far as we as far as we know. All right. So we take a totally different tack, um, and we try to think of how. How it is that min plus inner products or min plus matrix products can be easy? Okay, and this is where circuit complexity comes in. So we're going to give a new reduction from min plus algebra to normal algebra. And so the first key idea is that min plus inner products are actually easy with respect to circuit complexity. Okay, they're in fact easier than usual inner products. So this is counterintuitive because, right, if you want to compute uh, all pairs inner products, but this is just matrix multiplication, and we know how to do this in, in truly subcubic time. Um, min plus inner products, computing all pairs, is, is, as we said, equivalent to all pairs shortest path, but it, but we don't know how to do that one. Nevertheless, one is easy with respect to circuit complexity, and the other one is hard. And so the, what makes min plus inner products easy is that they're computable with so-called AC0 circuits. And so just to recall, uh, these are circuits which have constant depth, a constant number of layers. They have and, or, and not gates at each layer of unbounded Fanon. And they have polynomial size. So min plus inner products are computable with these very sort of fast parallel algorithms. But uh, a usual inner product, which involves, a, say, a, even a multiplication of two numbers, is not uh, computable with AC0. This is this is known. It was proved um, in the early 80s. Multiplication is not easy. So, but min plus inner products are easy in this respect, and we want to exploit this somehow. So, the the second key idea is to use some properties that we know of of AC0 circuits. So, these easy inner products can be reduced, in a certain sense, to polynomials over say the field of two elements. Uh, we'll, we're going to use the result of Rosbroff and Smolensky from uh, the late 80s, which gave a probabilistic reduction from, say, AC0 circuits. In fact, AC0 circuits, even with XOR gates thrown in, um, to low degree, so polylog degree polynomials over the field of two elements. And for every particular input to the original circuit, the probability this polynomial agrees with the circuit is, is going to be high. So let's say greater than, than 3 over 4. And this is really the only property um, that we're going to need, uh, that these min plus inner products are easy with respect to circuit complexity, and then they can therefore be reduced to polynomials in a particular sense. And uh, the final key idea is that these polynomials can be evaluated efficiently on many pairs of points. Right? So we took this inner product operation, we, re we reduce it to some polynomial, now we want to evaluate this polynomial on sort of many pairs of points, um, so sort of corresponding to computing the matrix product. And we'll use an algorithm of Coppersmith. We'll adapt this algorithm um, to do that. So, so these are the three uh, key ideas. 
in the talk, but you know, there's sort of much more going on underneath in order to get to this point. But this is the um, ba this is you know the one slide idea of of how we can use circuit complexity to solve uh, obsolete faster. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, yeah. so uh, in general, when you're talking about these min plus in the products, the entries yeah. are not in the entries are not zero one; they're integers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you do circuits, usually the inputs are Boolean are coming from like I don't know, a finite, very small set constant yes. size. That's so yes. going on. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, um, so this is why I said that I'm going to only cover theorem one prime in this talk. So, so all the weights are going to be between zero and and a polynomial on n. So we're going to think of those explicitly as order log n bit um, strings. Okay. So the okay. weights are are actually order log n bit strings that are going to be passed around through this circuit. We, so, in fact, this is, in a sense, necessary, right? Because we know that if you only allow additions and comparisons, then there are cubic lower bounds. And so, uh -huh. so it's kind of natural in retrospect to say we're going to circumvent these lower bounds by consider Boolean circuits that manipulate those comparisons like at the bit level. So the, the, the fact that you can compare like whether two strings, whether one string is at most another string using an AC0 circuit is very important because then we can manipulate that circuit at the bit level and get, you know, and, and sort of blow it up and so we're no longer talking about comparisons as some sort of unit operation. We just, we blew it up into a bunch of ands and ors and then a polynomial and so on. Uh, yeah, so I think that that, that uh, point is extremely important here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Can you get uh, intuition for where the the running time comes from in this outline? Um, yeah, so I think it'll be easier to see um, when I get to it. But the the idea is that we're going to we're going to re so just before so just to sort of uh, predict what's going to happen. So we're going to take an n by n an n by n by n uh, min plus matrix product. We're going to decompose it into a bunch of small uh, matrix products where the middle dimension is really small. It's going to be so small that one, even if we apply Rosbolf and Smolensky to that, to that middle dimension, um, it, won't, it won't increase the dimension by very much. Right? The problem with Rosbolf and Smolensky is that it will take a circuit of size S and blow it up to a polynomial that has like quasi-polynomial and S monomials. And so, the, so there's some trade-off going on there. And so, like, the, the square root log n, the 2 to the square root log n, the denominator is exactly coming from the fact that Rosbolf and Smolensky from a circuit of size s will give you a polynomial of, of size, uh, of, like, of a number of monomials quasi-polynomial on s. Um, but it will, it will be clearer w once I actually show the, the algorithm. But um, sort of a better reduction to polynomials, if it existed, um, would give you a better denominator. Um, I, I, hope that, I, don't, I hope that helps. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Alright, one more question. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So you're saying the, the key idea three, you say there you yes. can evaluate on pairs of points, did you uh, yeah. explain that? Why pairs and not just points? Oh, so, so right, so the, the way, one way to think about like a matrix product is that you have a collection, you have one collection of points, one collection of n points, but like, you know, each point is like a vector. Say, say you have n vectors in n dimensional space. That's one matrix. And you have n vectors in another, in the, you know, in, in other vectors in n dimensional space is another matrix. And the matrix product is then just taking all pairs of vectors, one from one collection and one from another collection, and computing some operation on them. Okay. This, so this, that's precisely what I mean here is that you have like different pairs of points. You have some distinguished variables, uh, say x variables for the polynomial, and some distinguished y variables, and you're trying all possible x values and y values in evaluating the polynomial on all of them. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so so these are the key ideas, and I'll and I'll go into them a in a little bit more detail. Um, but yeah, just 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 enough to give you uh, a good idea of what's going on. So the first the idea is that min plus inner products are easy. Okay. So, so just to be clear, so min plus inner product is defined as follows. So we're given, say, two uh, vectors of length n. 
let's say they have naturals uh, in the entries. So the min plus inner product is just going to be the min over all k of uk plus vk. Okay. This is basically just what you're getting when you're taking like the, and it's basically just the output of the min plus uh, matrix product on all the rows in, of A and the columns of B. Okay. So, um, so given some weight M, so given some number M, the min plus inner product of U and V with entries from 1 to M, so in both vectors of length N, the, this can be computed with um, AC0 circuits of size N uh, log M, something polynomial in N log M. Okay. Now, the, just think of it this way. So I'm actually giving you these vectors that specified in binary. Okay. So it's really, it really is order n log m to give you, to represent u in order n log m to represent v. And I'm computing the min plus inner product in size polynomial on that. Right. So this is just a proof sketch of how that goes. There's two parts. Um, one is that if you want to add two uh, numbers, okay, then we can do this in, si in polynomial size AC0. Okay? And uh, just to give you a picture of how this works, so um, you know, after the talk, you can Google carry look ahead adder. And uh, okay, this is a, a picture of a carry look ahead adder. Sorry if it's too small for, uh, for three bit numbers. Okay? So the idea is that um, for all, so you have like a bunch of so you have like some AIs and some B and some BIs, you want to add them. And so what we're going to do is determine in parallel which bit positions of the sum will have a carry bit. Okay. We do this by taking um, ands uh, for all i of the ith position of the number A and the ith position of number B. And we take all possible ors over these i's as well. And we can use this to determine exactly which bit positions you're going to have a carry in parallel. Now, once we know exactly which bit positions are going to get a carry in the final sum, we can just take the XOR of that carry bit and the two corresponding input bits. And we'll do that in parallel, too. And when all is said and done, we'll actually have a way of adding two numbers in, say, depth 4, uh, AC0. Okay. So you yeah. actually mean poly M, right, not log M, because the M was used for the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this M is not the same as the okay. M in the statement one, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So it's log M bit numbers this is in poly log size AC zero. Right. Yep. Yep. Uh, but okay, this is just a high level picture of what it is. I mean, this is something uh, very well known. It's in like I don't know, the first few pages of Vollmer's book, uh, Intro to Circuit Complexity. So I think it's, it's this, this book here. Uh, so, okay, so we can add two numbers efficiently in AC0, and so computing the minimum of n numbers, say each of them having n bits, this can also be done with polynomial size AC0. And I'll just sort of sketch why this is true. Um, so first is computing whether or not, say, a number x is at most number y is in AC0. Okay, again, constant, this is constant depth, um, and or not. So, I mean, it's not too hard to see how this would go. So you can say x is at most y if and only if, okay, this expression here is true. So, so the way to parse this expression is, okay, so the summation, the summation here is an xor, okay? And so if I'm taking 1 plus xi plus yi, this is going to be um, um, true when xi and y are equal. So the first disjunct is true if and only if x equals y. Okay. And then for i ranging from 1 to t, the corresponding disjunct in this expression is true if and only if the first uh, i minus 1 bits of x and y are equal, but xi is 0 and yi is 1, so y is larger. Okay. So you can just sort of compute all this stuff in parallel in this and take the or. Then a number x is minimum if and only if or x is in most y for all other numbers y. So then we can output x sub i as a minimum of a bunch of numbers if and only if the and over all j of x i at most uh, x j is true. So this is just involves like some constant number of layers of ands and ors and nots and some x ors at the bottom which you can represent using um, uh, ands and 
ors as well. It's a constant sinus xor. So, so all this is in AC0, and it's more or less uh, a standard fare in, in certain complexities. OK? Um, now, right, so like in the optimized version of this result, we don't go this way. We don't. We, we have some very, very uh, specialized thing where we have like a very special circuit using lots of XORs. And, and, uh, but this is just an idea of why min plus interprox are easy compared to usual interprox. All right, so the second key idea is that we want to reduce uh, this kind of um, easy interproduct to a polynomial. Right, and again, I'll just briefly uh, sketch this at a higher level. So the theorem of Roswald and Smolensky that we need is that for every AC0 circuit C, say even with XOR gates, with n inputs, size s and depth d, we can get an efficiently sampleable distribution, d, which is dependent on C. Uh, and it's a distribution of polynomials of, of degree uh, poly log s, so but, but d is in the exponent here. And these polynomials are over GF2. And they have the following property. For every particular uh, input to the circuit, in bit input, the probability that a random polynomial from this distribution agrees with the circuit is greater than 3 fourths. And well, the main point is that these polynomials have a smallish degree, and so the number of monomials in the polynomial will also be smallish. I mean, it could be quasi polynomial in S, um, but still not gigantic, not exponential. So just I'll give you a very high-level uh, idea of how you would do this, just give you a flavor. So you do it by induction on the depth of the circuit. So like if it were of depth 1, if it were a not gate, this is very easy to do, easy to represent that exactly as a polynomial. Um, for an XOR gate, this is also very easy to do, to represent it as a polynomial over GF2. You just take the sum mod 2. Now, for an OR gate or for an AND gate, um, dually, it gets tricky. So, so for all points x, um, there's like a, there are very uh, well-known uh, sort of random uh, subset sum trick where you say take, so take a random vector r um, with entries in 0, 1, and take the inner product of that with your vector x, and with probability at least a half, uh, you will agree with the OR function on n variables. Okay. And you know, this is just you know, a very standard XOR trick that's been used in, in lots, of, lots of settings, and it's uh, key to the results of Roswell and Smolensky. So they kind of amplify this trick a bit. So instead of sort of picking a single vector, you can pick a random k by n matrix, uh, where k is some error parameter. You're going to try to keep it small. And then for all uh, n bit points, um, you can construct the following kind of polynomial. Uh, so you can basically take 1 plus the product over all j, ranging from 1 to k, of 1 plus uh, the sum over all i, ranging from 1 to n, of ri ij times xi mod 2. So we're basically taking the XOR trick, the very simple XOR trick, and taking sort of products of this XOR trick to try to um, increase uh, the, the probability of success. Okay. So this will be a degree k polynomial, since the product uh, over the j's is from 1 to k, simulating or, and it will have error uh, most 1 and 2 to k. And I mean, I can talk about why, exactly why this polynomial works, but um, maybe it's not so important. The main idea is that you would say, uh, to, to apply this in general to circuits, you would say set x to be something like 10 log s, sorry, set k to be something like 10 log s, so your, your error will be like 1 in you know, s to the 10 or something, or something like that. And you apply this trick to all of the OR gates of the circuit. So without loss of generality, they could be just all OR gates, because you can take ands and convert them to um, nots and ors. Um, so you apply this trick to all of them, and then expand uh, the resulting arithmetic expression. And when you expand it, you'll get to a sum of monomials, you'll get so, you'll end up multiplying the degree by a factor of order log s for every layer in the circuit, and so this is why you'll get a polynomial degree uh, log s to the order d. Um, I'm hand waving a lot here, but this is I mean this is 
is just some trick that one can look up in a textbook, several textbooks, and uh, so that's that's the main idea. You can reduce some subpolymers. Sure. But yeah. naively, it seems like you're increasing the degree by a factor of k each time, so it's going to be much worse. Oh, so you're going to sit. Oh, um, yeah. So, um, okay. In general, you're not going to. Um, so, you're going to you're going to multiply it by a factor of order log s, right? So the degree, right? The degree is going to get multiplied every time. Like, say, if you had a bunch of ors of ands of ors of ands and stuff like that, right? The, the degree, so when you set k to be order uh, log s, right, it will be a degree order can log s polynomial at, at every, right. at every but point. Can the fan yeah. be much larger? Like, can the fan be s or? Um, well, no, I mean, not in, uh, in general, because basically what you're doing, actually, is you're reducing the fan in. So you can think of this as saying, I have... Let's say this is an OR um, of over S inputs. Okay, what I'm really doing is converting this OR to an XOR, okay, the one plus the product, of an AND, but this right. AND is only order log S. Right. Of, of an XOR. So that, so you can think of it totally circuit complexity wise and say, okay, I'm taking this OR of large fan in and I'm reducing it randomly to an XOR of an AND of small fan in of XORs. Um, so yeah. right. So then, when you expand it, you're only multiplying by a factor of order log right. s. Each Makes time. sense. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. No problem. Okay. So all right. So that's so that's Roswell and Smolensky in a in a nutshell. And all right. So let's get to the um, the third idea of polynomial evaluation. Okay. So so a well known result is that one can evaluate a degree n univariate polynomial at n points of one's choice. In order n log n operations, this is like one of these standard things you can do with with FFTs. And so operations here being additions and multiplications. So what we want to do is we want to evaluate a min plus inner product on n squared pairs of vectors. We have you know, n vectors from one matrix A, n vectors from another matrix B. We want to evaluate this min plus inner product. So we're going to translate that problem into evaluating a multivariate polynomial in n squared pairs of points. And so we can do this very efficiently, provided that polynomial is sparse. Okay. So if it's sparse enough, we can do it really efficiently, much, much more efficiently than just say n squared times the sparsity, much more efficiently than that. Okay. So, so suppose we're so the formal theorem is suppose we're given uh, two sets of points. Okay. They're, these points are uh, n bit vectors. One set is of size n, the other sets of size n, and we're given a polynomial over a distinguished uh, sets of variables. So there are mx variables and my variables. And this polynomial is over f2, say. Um, now there's nothing special particularly here about f2, except that addition and multiplication in f2 are in constant time. But any s sufficiently small field or polynomial of small coefficients will work here. Um, so, but here it's just over f2. The number of monomials, so this, si this size measure of q means number of monomials. So let's suppose it's at most n to the 0 0.1. Okay, so we've got n n points in A, n points in B, our monomial it has into the point 0.1 monomials, then we can evaluate this polynomial Q on all pairs of points, X and Y. So taking one uh, point from A, one point from B, concatenating them, we can evaluate Q on all these in n squared polylog n time. Okay. What's significant here is that if we were to do it naively, then Right, it would be n squared times the sparsity of the polynomial, it'd be n to the 2.1. But here we're getting n squared polylog n time, so polylog n amortized time um, over all the pairs of points. And this this is uh, significant. This is exactly where we're going to get the savings. We're not going to get it, so we're not going to get into the 2.9 here, unfortunately, because our polynomial will get big relative to the circuit we were trying to simulate by Rosbolf and Smolinski. But but nevertheless, we're getting some kind of savings here. And the proof idea is to embed this problem into an efficient matrix product. Um, so, how much time <laughs> do I do I have <laughs> to talk? Actually, uh, uh, let me see what the time, what the yeah, time is. Oh, at, least, at least twenty more minutes. Uh, oh, 20, Okay, then fine. I'll, I can easily talk about this then. 
I just want to make sure that, like, right, if you wanted to wrap up in, like, completely in 10 minutes, then, then okay. I don't think but, it's fair to take 5, 10 more minutes. Okay. All right. So so I can go over this uh, thing, and it's basically one slide. It's it's pretty in, pretty intuitive when once you see it in the right way. Um, right. So we have this. So we have this problem. We're going to evaluate all pairs of points, like you know, points fed to x variables and points fed to to the y variables. Okay. So I just put the theorem uh, up there. So okay. So here's the proof. We just denote a by a1 through a n. Just let this number the index of points that way, and b through b1 through bn. Right. Now we're going to create uh, two matrices. We're going to create an n by the size of q, matrix A prime. And the rows of A prime are going to be indexed by these elements, A1 through An. The columns of A prime will be indexed by these different monomials of q. Right. There's n of the point 1 monomial. So this will be an n by n of the point 1 uh, matrix in general. And we're going to analogously create a matrix B prime. But it is sort of a transpose well, with rows indexed by monomials and columns indexed by the elements of B. Okay. So now we're going to define um, this A prime specifically as follows. So the IJ entry is going to be the value of the jth monomial of Q. So we have some indexing of the monomials of Q. It will be the value of the jth monomial of Q, but restricted only to the X variables. So by this I mean you take this monomial, the jth monomial of Q, you remove the Y variables. Just remove them and then evaluate the remaining x variables on a sub i, the i element of a. Recall that a is supposed to be an assignment to x variables, and the b's are supposed to be assignments to the y variables. Okay. So that's how I'm going to define a prime. I'm going to define b prime totally analogously. So I'm going to take the jth monomial of q restricted to the y variables, so throw out the x variables, and evaluate the remaining y variables on b sub k, the k element of b. All right. Now, let's just look at what happens when I take a matrix product. So, if I take A prime IJ times B prime JK, this is going to be the value of the jth monomial of Q on the assignment AI BK. Because right? one has, is just telling me what the value is in the X variables, and one is telling me what the value is in the Y variables. Their product is going to be the value on the whole monomial. And then when I take uh, the matrix product, so this should be A prime times B prime, okay? if I look at the IK entry, this is going to be the sum over all the monomials of Q of a prime ij times b prime jk, which is just going to be the value of this uh, polynomial q on a i b k. And so, so now we've reduced the problem to uh, computing a matrix product where the middle dimension is somewhat small. So we're taking an n by n of the point one matrix, n of the point one by n matrix, and um, using the results of Coppersmith, we can show this this, this can be multiplied in n squared polylog n uh, time. And so, so that's basically it. It's just a, taking this uh, polynomial evaluation problem and embedding it into a matrix multiply in the right way. Yeah. So, so that's that theorem. Now I'm um, ready to, to talk about the, the uh, opposite algorithm. All right. So, yeah. okay, it was, the computer was almost crashing. So, so given uh, two matrices A and B, we want to compute this min plus uh, uh, matrix product. All right. So we're going to let um, D be some parameter. So it'll be something like 2 to the log n of the delta for some delta you know, greater than 0, but, but less than 1. Okay, so D is supposed to be something small, smaller, has some volume, but smaller than n. All right. So the first step is that we're going to, we're going to partition this matrix A into n by D matrices. Okay, there will be n over d, n by d matrices. And we're going to partition it like this. So suppose A look, has this kind of shape. Then we're going to make A1 you know, be, um, be really skinny, and A2 be really skinny, and so on. So, this will, so d is really small. So each of these will be n by d matrices. Right. And then we're going to partition b into d by n matrices, b1 through uh, b n over d. So we'll be n over d of those. And this is just partitioning in the other direction. So it will be, it'll be really short and, and fat matrices. So D by N, where D is much smaller than N. All right. So the, the key observation, uh, which um, was totally known, I mean, this is like a trick that was used even by Fredman and all the previous algorithms, is that if we want to compute the min plus inner product in the IJ entry, it suffices to compute all these uh, min plus inner products of these 
uh, skinny matrices. So it's an n by d and a d by n. Okay. So once we compute all those, then what what we want in our inner product is just a minimum over all that. So if we just take the minimum over all of these matrix products, we will have exactly the min plus product. And so we're, we're just taking um, um, these sort of separate matrix products. They each give us some candidates for the minimum. We take the minimum of that, that will be the, the minimum overall. And you would like to do this in like n square poly log n time? Exactly, exactly. Individual. So, exactly, yeah. So given these, given these products, right, it takes, you know, n cubed over d time to, to get the final one by just simply computing minima, right? This, that's, um, Right, for all for all the IJ entries, we compute the minimum over all k. Right, so so now we wish to maximize d, such that n by d and d by n min plus matrix product is computable in n squared polylog n time. Okay, what so so this uh, denominator that we get in the final outcome is exactly the result of maximizing d as much as possible, and this maximization you know is constrained by this uh, reduction of min plus inner products to to polynomials and. Okay. So we want d to be super polylogarithmic because we can always obviously compute this thing in n squared times d time. Um, but right, so we want d to be like something like two to the log n of the delta. Okay, so all everything on this slide, again, was known. I mean, and Fredman used it in the 70s, and all the later algorithms use this kind of trick. And the new trick is like to get this rectangular min plus matrix product to be done in nearly optimal time. Okay, for large for large uh, inner dimension d. All right, so this is the novel part. Okay, so so provided we can get n by d and d by n, uh, n plus matrix product, and essentially n squared time, then we'll get n cubed over d. All right, so so now we're given, say, one of these a, uh, a k b k's, which are n by d and d by n. We're going to let c be some a c zero circuit for computing the min plus inner product of of two d-length vectors with entries from zero to uh, n to the k. All right, so we're just going to try to solve the problem for um, for weights which are just between zero and and some polynomial in n. So we're just going to take an AC zero circuit for that. Sorry, did someone ask a question? Um, so so this circuit has. Um, Right, it has d times k log n inputs, okay, and it's going to give us a single output, which is a minimum of the sum of two numbers, which are you know, between zero and n the k. So it will it will be uh, an order k log n bit output, and the total size will be polynomial in the number of inputs. Okay, so this is just we're given we're giving you uh, two vectors of length d, and each each entry has order uh, k log n bits in it. So now we're going to do the following. So, so there's uh, ordered log n outputs of this circuit, and for every output bit, we have a we have like a different subcircuit of this thing. It's going to output a single bit, and we're going to process uh, each of these little subcircuits. We're going to process each output bit at a, at a time, and use polynomials to to simulate uh, what the min plus matrix product would would do. Okay, so we're going to Pick a uh, random polynomial, say order log n, uh, random polynomials from this distribution that will simulate the circuit C on this J output bit. And so it's giving us a single output bit. Um, we're going to pick order log n, uh, random polynomials from this distribution, simulate We know we can do this efficiently. Um, and so for all ij, right, the, we, we will have a bound on the degree of that. So it will be. Um, log the the size uh, to some power, call it c, some constant c. Okay, and therefore the number of monomials in this polynomial will be at most the total number of variables. So the number of variables was order dk log n to the degree. And so it'll look something like that, uh, a good looking expression, right? And we want to set d so that this thing is still somewhat small. Because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take each of these polynomials and evaluate them on all rows of a k and columns of, of b j. So we think of the rows of a k as being, you know, these x variables, like part, like one uh, half of the variables uh, being fed to the polynomial, 
and the columns of VK being the other half of the variables being fed. So the corresponding to the Y variables in our uh, earlier lemma. All right, so we're going to evaluate all those. And then when we're done, so we've got like 10 log n different bits of output, and we're just going to output the majority bit. Okay, and the idea is very simple that um, if, you know, for every fixed point, um, if I'm picking these random polynomials, they're going to agree with whatever the circuit output with probability at least three-fourths. Okay, so if I have uh, a number of these, like say 10 log n of these, then the 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 probability that it's going to be correct on all n squared uh, entries of the matrix with high probability, um, so it will just it'll be really high by just standard tail bounds. Um, outputting the majority bit will be the correct bit for all the n squared uh, bits of output. And so the key thing is that okay, this step B, this polynomial evaluation, we can do it in n pi log n time, provided the size of these polynomials is not too large. So what we need is that you know the number this expression for the number of monomials is at most in the point one. Okay? And now it's just a matter of solving for d. Solving for this d. So if we set d to be, for example, 2 to the log n to the 1 over c plus 1, that over 10, um, then we will satisfy this inequality. And so what we'll do is for all these order log n output bits, j of the circuit. We're going to run this uh, loop, and this loop will take um, order uh, n squared pi log n time. Okay, so it overall will take order n squared pi log n time. Okay. And this is the, sort of exactly um, where we get the savings in the denominator. Um, uh, Ryan? Okay. Yes. So the time to sample a random polynomial, isn't yes. it polynomial in the size of the circuit? We're so sampling um, all these R's that you had. Yes, yes, yes. But see, notice that the circuit is is small. The circuit is like polynomial in two to the log n to the delta, right? So this is. But it has size uh, d. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so in fact, okay, yeah. So in fact, you can do that beforehand, right? So you can do that before you, right? So like, it's not like you're doing it every time you want to compute an entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You 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 do it you do it in advance okay. and then. And then do it for all the entries, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm only doing it order log n times, or actually log squared times. So I'm doing it, you know, for all output bits j. I'm doing it uh, order log n, you know, uh, for each of those output bits. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is that right, that that circuit is really small compared to the input. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's so that's um, the the thing in a nutshell. Um, Right, so we we had this min plus inner product. We reduce it to so min plus matrix product. We reduce it to a bunch of skinny min plus matrix products. We blow up the like a circuit computing those inner products into a, a polynomial that's slightly larger. But once it's a polynomial, we can use fast matrix multiply for rectangular matrices uh, to do each of those really efficiently. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm ready to move uh, to the conclusion. Okay. Yes. Question. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to know, is it, is it necessary to pick uh, 10 log n polynomials, or can you just uh, use the log n with uh, like small error cells? Yeah, I mean, there, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some optimizations you can do. I mean, you may pay more in the actual um, denominator. Like, right, if you make the error low in Rosboff and Smolensky, then it will make the degree high, and that will make your d, uh, you know, be worse um, in the end. So I mean, but there, yeah, there are definitely like things you can play with here, and like the paper plays with <laughs> lots and lots of tricks. So like I go through uh, a few pages to like really optimize like how this polynomial can be constructed. Because here I didn't exploit the fact that you know over f2 xor is for free. Like xor doesn't add anything to the degree, so it's to your it's in your best interest to throw in as many XORs into your circuit for min plus inner product as possible. And when you do that, you yeah, you start to save uh, a whole lot. Okay. Any more questions? So, Because I'm, I'm about to move to the conclusion. Okay. All right. 
So, um, so this approach leads to faster algorithms for many other problems, not just things which you know um, would normally take cubic time. There's some even some other problems like sort of sparse graph problems that can be sped up as a functional number of edges. And I would just defer you the paper for that. Um, so there are some problems where I don't know how to apply these ideas, and I really love to. So one is one very infamous problem is the so-called three-sum problem, where you're given a collection of n numbers, and you want to know if there are three which sum to zero. Let's just say they're, they're integers. You want to know if there are three that sum to zero. Okay. So um, n squared can be gotten by you know, hashing tricks, and um, you can get our results of um, Baran, Domain, and Petrovsky. You can get something like n squared over log squared n. And it would be really cool to, to, to see if this could be beaten by some sort of polynomial trick, some kind of circuit trick. But, but, um, but uh, yeah, I really don't know, but it's just a, a nice question that uh, I'd like you know, to, to raise and have people think about. So another thing is that I'd like to yeah, say why I think we could get truly subcubic uh, or using this kind of approach, extending it further. So combining this paper uh, with another new paper I have, which is about um, circuit lower bounds, it's about threshold circuits, we can obtain the following. So suppose the min plus inner product of two vectors can be computed by depth two linear threshold circuits of polynomial size. Let's say they have exponential weights on the, the threshold gates. So this is actually a very seemingly really powerful model that we don't know how to prove a lower bounds for. We don't even know depth two linear threshold circuit lower bounds when they're exponential weights. But suppose a min plus inner product could be computed by these things. Then, in fact, we can get uh, truly subcubic time for APSP. And the reason is that I have a, it, have a fast evaluation algorithm for depth two linear threshold circuits of polynomial size in the other paper. Okay. And so this is a really nice kind of uh, disjunction here. Right? So we, either we get threshold circuit lower bounds, <laughs> either we can show that min plus inner product can't be computed by depth two linear threshold circuits, like say in some uniform uh, constructive way, or we get truly subcubic uh, upslope. Up. And so, yeah, so this is kind of um, interesting connection. And one could imagine that maybe there's some other way to reduce min plus inner product to some efficiently evaluated um, object, in which case you would get truly subcubic. Okay, so so that's something. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. And finally, uh, circuit complexity has developed many tools for analyzing and manipulating low depth circuits. And these low depth circuits are, are in fact, uh, quite powerful in some cases, um, as we saw here. So I'd like to encourage, just in general, more applications to algorithm design. Right? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, John. Questions? I have a question. Uh, I have a question. Okay. No. Uh, so okay. what are the odds that the hypothesis is true that uh, uh, depth to threshold circuits uh, cannot can compute uh, the oh. plus in the product? Yeah, I don't know. I really, I'm really not sure which should be true. Um, so it, it's possible. Okay, I mean, that general in product we don't believe. I right? general in product between two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Min plus. So, I guess if you could do min plus, um, yeah, it's it's not it's not clear. It's not clear. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's natural to conjecture that it can't be done, and that we just won't ever prove it or something, <laughs> right? Right. But um, yeah, exponential weights are are really tricky. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, one more question. Uh, so, what is known about the approximate versions of computing? APSP, whatever that means, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, suppose you, yeah, suppose you have, let's say, arbitrary weights, and you want to output shortest paths within, like, say, one, one plus epsilon. Uh -huh. say, in other words, paths which are of cost no more than one plus epsilon to the shortest one. And uh -huh. in that case, you can get something like uh, n to the omega matrix multiplication exponent over. Uh, a polynomial in epsilon. I think the polynomial oh. is actually maybe epsilon. Epsilon or epsilon oh. squared. I had to look it up. But yeah, this is a result of Urizvik. Yeah. So if, oh. yeah, if you want one plus epsilon approximations, 
um, you can you can get that. But uh, again, if your error starts to get you know polynomially low, then yeah, it doesn't work. And you you don't get uh, faster R limit. I've got a, I've got a small question about the table of results at the beginning. Yes. Were those algorithms deterministic or randomized? And uh, if deterministic, was there any result known for randomized algorithms? Um, they were. I, th I think they were all deterministic. I think all of them were deterministic. Um, yeah, I don't think there was any any uh, randomized algorithm that had some advantage. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, here it's it's quite possible that the, this algorithm could be completely de-randomized and get the same exactly the same running time too. Um, yeah, I mean, like it's it's possible that like the circuit complexity tools are just so powerful that they there's like just some gigantic hammer that allows you to hit the problem. But if you were to study min plus inner products directly, you would have something much nicer. Yeah. yeah. Before we go on, let me just mention that. Um, we have so we have about ten people watching us on YouTube, and okay. if you, in case you want to join, <coughs> I just posted the link oh. on the comments. So you're welcome to join, oh. uh, just to say hi or to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, wait, so where, where are the comments? Sorry, I didn't, I don't see them. No, no, we will we'll transfer the comments to you. But I'm just saying, oh. those who watched on YouTube, they they're not visible here. They're not part of the hangout. Yeah. They're watching. Oh, okay. Yeah, live, but they're not visible here. So if they want, they're welcome to join. I just posted the the URL. Okay. Okay. Any more okay. questions? So, so I have another question. Yes, I have another question. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Suppose you have a, a really efficient matrix multiplication uh, method, say like yeah, uh, say order of the output length of the matrix. Sure. Yeah. Can you can you improve your algorithm or how much? Hmm. That's a good question. Um. Currently, I mean, the, there would be an improvement, but it would only be in the omega, right, of the de denominator. So, like I said, the denominator is two to the omega log n to the to the one half. Right. So the, there would be an improvement, but it only be in that omega, that that leading um, omega term. So it wouldn't be. I mean, it would be better, but right, like um, what you'd like to do is improve. Um, Improve like the square root log n to something like maybe log n to three fours or just log n entirely. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, it would improve it, but but um, only yeah, only by like some omega term in the x, by only some constant term, but in the exponent of the denominator. So if there are no other questions, let me just turn off the recording, but you're all welcome to stay a bit and chat, so I'm going offline now. <laughs>